Joseph was a righteous man. It means he was a good guy. He did what he should. He did what was right. But did you happen to notice what the right thing is in this story? According to St. Matthew, the good thing to do, the right thing to do, is to divorce Mary. He had to, really. He had no choice. In that time and at that place, marriage was specifically for raising offspring. And the offspring she would be raising was not his. He couldn't do it. He shouldn't do it. Not only was it not in his best interest, there was a law about what ought to happen to women who got pregnant before they got married. And Joseph was a righteous man. He followed the law. Except this time. Instead of doing what he should, what he had a right and even an expectation to do, he decided to end things quietly so that she would not face the full shame of a public divorce. They would call things off quietly and go their separate ways, and nobody needed to know. They'd all find out eventually, of course, but not from him. So already we're wondering, did he plan to dismiss her quietly because he was a righteous man, or in spite of it? Is what he does for Mary righteous or not? Regardless of what the answer might be to that question, he is set to follow through on this intention until an angel appears with a message that he should, instead of doing what is righteous, stay the course because God is up to something. In effect, the angel says, do nothing. Keep going. Watch what happens. This really calls into question what it means to be righteous, or even simply just right. What's the right thing to do? To follow the law? To show compassion? To proceed as planned? It's interesting and possibly informative to note that all this stuff about Mary and Joseph so far this is prologue. This is in the past tense. This is just Matthew setting the scene. The story itself, the action, begins with the intervention of the angel. In other words, the first person to act in this narrative is not Joseph or Mary, but God. God is the first one to do something. What does that say about all of Joseph's righteousness? What is it worth? What does it accomplish? As I read this story, I'd say that for Matthew, it doesn't count for a hill of beans. Because the real focus of this story is not on anything that Joseph does, but on what God is doing. In that light, the, the angel's message begins to make a little bit more sense, maybe. Do nothing. Keep going. Watch what happens. If the real actor in the story is God, then what Joseph does or intends to do really only matters in light of what God is doing, doesn't it? If he goes through with his plan, Mary will still be pregnant and the baby will still come, but Joseph won't be a part of that story. He will write himself out of what God is doing. And that tells me that in the angel's directive to wait, there's grace to be found. For all of Joseph's righteousness, whatever that means or looks like, the only righteousness that really counts in this story is God's. And I think that's an important point to make because I know how quick I am to take these Bible stories and make them about myself, right? What should I do? How should I be? What's the right thing for me to take away from this? And given the conversations I keep having about these stories with folks, I think the same is true for a lot of us. Maybe all of us. I don't know. <laughs>
This story comes up in the lectionary every three years. And every three years, at this time of year, on this third, fourth week in Advent, I end up having the same conversations about whether or not Mary was actually a virgin, as an example. Because that's what we see in this text. We, that's where our attention goes. From what I can tell, it goes there because we, whatever we believe about that, we all have this need to figure out whether one can be a Christian without believing in the Immaculate Conception. For some, that is a theological tenet that's become an indicator of orthodoxy. No Immaculate Conception, no correct faith. But in the context of Matthew's story about Joseph here, I have to wonder, does our own theological rightness, or righteousness, if you will, does it matter at all? Does God care what we believe? The message of the angel to Joseph in this story is, in no uncertain terms, to rely on what God is doing rather than on his own actions. He can do whatever he wants, but if he wants to be a part of God's story, his best bet is to do nothing, to keep going, to watch what happens. It makes me wonder how much our own understanding of what is righteous, whatever that means, whether that's orthodox or moral or pious, if any of those things really matter at all to God. Often we hear God calling us to go and do or to come and see, but how often might God simply be calling us to watch and wait and pay attention? to see what God is doing rather than to jump in for ourselves and start acting on God's behalf. Let's back up for a moment to Isaiah's story. It's a story that none of us would probably know if Matthew hadn't quoted it here because it's a story, frankly, that takes place in a very specific historical moment. Without getting into all the international politics, King Ahaz of Judah is facing a threat from the combined forces of two other kings, King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel. The prophet Isaiah tells Ahaz to ask God for a sign. Ask for anything you can imagine, he says. A sign of what God is about to do. And Ahaz refuses. Now his refusal sounds pious enough, doesn't it? I will not put the Lord to the test. But here you've got the Lord's prophet telling him to do just that. Go ahead, put me to the test, God says. God wants to give Ahaz a sign. So why is he refusing? If you read the story, Ahaz doesn't want a sign because he's already decided what he's going to do. He's already decided to send envoys to Assyria to ask for help. He's already placed his trust in that giant global superpower to the north to save him. I think he refuses a sign because he's afraid that if he asks for a sign, God will tell him to do something else. And that's just what God does. God says, in essence, through Isaiah, the same thing that the angel tells Joseph. Isaiah says, there's a young woman who is already pregnant. By the time her son is old enough to eat solid food, the threat you fear will be gone. God is already handling this. Do nothing. Keep going. Watch what happens. The sign from God is already on the way, and nothing can stop it. The kid to be born, regardless of what his mother names him, is a living sign that God is with us. And in Hebrew, that is Emmanuel. This is what is hard for both Joseph and Ahaz, and I suspect for us as well, if we're being honest. God with us so seldom looks like we expect it to. God's presence is so often characterized by confusion and ambiguity and doubt. 
The angel tells Joseph not to make the prudent choice. The prophet tells Ahaz not to bet on the sure thing. Instead, they're to wait, to do nothing, to watch what happens. Instead of taking action, they are invited to trust that God is with us. For Ahaz, that trust means watching armies advance on Jerusalem. For Joseph, it means accepting the shame as being known as a rube and a cuckold for the rest of his life. It means accepting and embracing loss and ignominy and death. Look at Joseph, for Pete's sake. Unlike Peter or Paul or John, he's never mentioned after Jesus' childhood. Most of the evangelists don't mention him at all. He's forgotten by the apostles and by the entire church until that time comes every year to pull him out of the cupboard and set him next to Mary in the nativity scene. He's a silhouette of a character. And yet, in embracing all the shame and the loss that comes with this child called God with us, Joseph experiences renewal and resurrection Turns out he's a great dad to this kid that isn't his, protecting and supporting his scandalous family, and he becomes the means of God's grace. His counter-righteous naming and adoption of this illegitimate child into his family becomes Jesus' connection to that Davidic lineage that everybody sings about. Joseph may not be the hero of this story, but he doesn't need to be because God already is, and God is with him. God is with us because that's just who God is. But God with us doesn't always mean the comfort and joy that we might expect. We crave a world of resurrection without death, of answers without doubt, of renewal without loss, but Jesus' very existence refuses this. He's born in shame and scandal, and he dies the same way. And yet he also frees us from these things. In his death, he shows us how rejection and abandonment and even violence somehow become the means by which God saves us from our sins, from the evil and the harm that we do to ourselves and one another. Even in these things, somehow, God is still with us. Even in these things, God somehow is saving us. God always has been and always will be. God is with us in all of life and in all of death, in our experience of loss and in the renewal that comes out of that loss. And our righteousness changes all of that, not one iota, one way or the other. Just like Joseph's righteousness doesn't change Mary's pregnancy. The angel's message to do nothing and watch what happens is not about passivity or fatalism, but about trusting God to be God. It's about letting go of our own ideas about what is right or proper and allowing God to do what God will do. And I notice that the invitation to do nothing in this story doesn't mean that Joseph sits on his hands. It means that he lets things happen as they will. It doesn't mean he's passive. It means that he lets things go. It means he makes the choice to stick around while God continues to write the story. So what might this story mean for us? When does God invite us to go and do? And when is the invitation instead to wait and watch? I don't know. How are we to proceed? What's the right or the righteous course of action? Is it obedience to the law? Compassion? Trust in God's salvation? Yeah, sure. Maybe. Or not. Who knows? 
I don't think there's a single answer to that question, but you know what? I think that's by design. That uncertainty, that darkness that keeps us from seeing what lies ahead, that's Emmanuel too. Righteousness is not ours to define or to possess or to achieve. But God, who is righteous, is with us. Saving us from our mistakes, bringing life from death and victory from failure, saving us from the harm that we would do to ourselves and to one another. Maybe that's all the righteousness we really need. Sometimes all we can do is nothing. Sometimes we can just keep going and watch what happens.